ADHD Rewired, episode 436. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host, and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is a more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection, and you are not alone. Go to ADHDRewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free and secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter, you can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups, learn all about our award-winning coaching and accountability groups, you can co-work with us in our adult study hall virtual membership community. You can do all of these things by going to our website at ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today, we have two guests joining us from Australia. First, we have who we've had on the show before, Jonathan Hassel. Jonathan is an ADHD and executive function coach and the director of Connect ADHD Coaching, providing services internationally from Brisbane, Australia. His background includes psychiatric services and as a scientific advisor for ADHD in the pharmaceutical industry. Jonathan trained as an ADHD coach in the U.S. and offers individuals, individual and group programs for people with ADHD. He's a regular speaker at national ADHD meetings in Australia and the U.S. He is a board member of ADA and a published author, which we're going to talk about his uh, new book, who... Uh, he worked with with our other guest, who is Madeline O'Reilly, who, uh, unlike all of my other guests, I have I'm meeting for the very first time today. But Madeline is uh, works with children and adults um, with ADHD and anxiety. She spent the last decade working in a multidisciplinary practice in Sydney called Mind Care Center. Here is where her interest in ADHD was sparked. And she enjoys working in collaboration with other medical professionals, especially psychiatrists. Prior to this, she spent three years working in East London for a cognitive behavioral therapy service that specialized in treating trauma in adults. Before moving to the UK, Madeline worked for Vision Australia. This led her to develop skills with children, adolescents, and adults in assessment and treatment of behavioral problems and mental health difficulties in the vision-impaired population. There's a whole lot more to your bio, but I think we'll get into that as we uh, get into this conversation. So Madeline and Jonathan, welcome to both of you. And let's get you both here unmuted. Hey, Eric. Thanks for that lovely intro. Hi. Well, thank you. All right. So you guys have a new book that you just came out with. We, we do. do. <laughs> All right. Uh, so why don't you tell me a bit about, uh, about this new book, uh, Decoding Doing, Getting It Done with ADHD. So Madeline and I were, were stumbling around our professional ADHD organization conference here a few years ago, and we started talking about what did we want to share. And Madeline is a clinical psychologist and myself as a coach. We have slightly different approaches, and we sort of looked at, well, what's, what's one of the, the big ADHD um, targets? And procrastination came up, of course. <laughs> and then we procrastinated about it for a while. And then we came back and said, hey, we should do something about this. So basically, we, we broke it down. And we started from the idea of instead of saying, like, hey, let's focus on the problem. Let's, let's instead focus on what should be happening if you have ADHD. And that's different from what should be happening if you don't have ADHD. So we, we broke down the process of actually doing or achieving and came up with Decoding Doing, which is our book. Madeline, what, it, what was your uh, um, sort of contribution to, uh, to working with Jonathan on this book? It's been an interesting process in that um, we've been talking and thinking about procrastination for like maybe four years. And I think initially we, we were quite curious as to like, how do we help someone not procrastinate? And we had all of these flow charts going and all sorts of like, if this happens, then we could do this. If this happens, then we could do that. And all sorts of strategies and ideas and kind of too much. And then I think at some point along the way, we realized that really 
we can forget all of that if we can actually work out how to keep someone on track from start to finish with the task. And I guess that's where we've ended up with the model in this book. All right. So, so talk to us about the model. What, what is, um, what is it mean to decode doing? So the model is around understanding all of the aspects to getting a task done. So we've broken it into five stages. So the acronym we've used is CIMA, C-I-M-A-A, and that stands for Connect, Imagine, Motivate, Act, and Achieve. The idea is that at each stage, the model gives you sufficient direction and safety nets that are appropriate for ADHD to keep you on track and essentially avoid falling off and procrastinating or avoiding completing the task. And I think a big big part of that too is um, also being aware of how it feels with ADHD to approach each of those. Like the reason we call it imagine instead of planning is because with ADHD, we, we're great imagineers you know, at the risk of offending Disney, um, that that we, 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 we're great at thinking things through and speculating and imagining, but then what happens is we don't organize it. And this has been the unifying theme throughout each of those five stages is how do we organize it better? So how do we organize it better? Well, good question, Eric. So, <laughs> so Madeline and I broke it down to a really simple little acronym, NAC, N-A-C, which is Notice, Analyze and Choose. And if you think about it with ADHD, that's the that's, well, first thing, self-awareness. I mean, Barclay talks about self-awareness being the entryway to executive function. And I, I love that, that, that price of entry idea, that if we're not doing it, we're sort of in big trouble, um, or as we'd say in Australia, stuffed. Um, so um, <laughs> I'm going to start slipping in Australian idioms now. As long as you but, explain um, them. Yeah, yeah, as, long as, I, as long as I translate. So first we've got to notice we're going to be self-aware, So, which is a big problem for us. So what we have to do is we have to find systems for being self-aware. Then the second part of organizing anything for us is we have to analyze it. Now, with working memory, that makes that challenging because the idea is we've got to analyze anything. You've got to hold two things in comparison. So we have to be able to stop and obviously sometimes, if necessary, externally analyze, either verbally or writing it down, um, which relieves that load on working memory. The last part is we um, need to um, choose, which again, ADHD, we we often don't actually stop and say, no, this is what I'm going to do now, or I'm going to choose to focus on this particular aspect. So by using Notice, Analyze, Choose, you can apply that across Connect, Imagine, Motivate, um, Act act or Action, and, and Achieve. And if you're doing it at each one, you tend to organize them. Break us break this down even more. So you have this uh, connect. What do you, what do you mean by connect? So connect is where you um, actually really clarify with yourself that you're going to do this thing. So it's quite an emotional stage. So um, it's really about having the idea of the task and actually really understanding what emotionally is coming up for you. Because we've often seen with a lot of um, people with ADHD who may struggle with procrastination is that they'll approach a task, they want to do the task, but then all sorts of things get triggered off. So lots of baggage from the past or lots of experiences of failure or, you know, all sorts of um, uncomfortable feelings and memories will come up, which then serve to kind of really distract and get in the way of this particular task. That stage is really about taking a moment to understand what is going on. This is what's going on. I'm getting triggered. I've got this other stuff getting in my way. Let's get some clarity around. Do I want and need to do the thing, this particular task now? What what feelings would serve me at this point in time? So a little bit of organizing your emotional state. So trying to access some sense of competency and clarity around the task and why you're doing it and then stepping forwards with as little baggage as possible. So is that, is that part happened during the planning process or when, you know, you're, you're sort of looking at your, your to-do list and noticing the, the emotions sort of coming up when you're like, oh, I don't want to do that. I mean, that in particular, that step one is that at the very beginning, all of those feelings that come up. And then I think that does continue to happen really as you move through the task. But we found that if you can get take a moment and get some clarity and awareness around it at the very beginning, you're in a much better place to, yeah. to roll through it well. 
And, and keep in mind with ADHD too, it's not just about, oh, I don't feel like doing that task. Often it's we're, we're driven to do tasks we shouldn't do. And it's because we're so externally focused, we're pleasing someone else. So that, that, that little pause to say, wait a minute, do I really want to go and move cupboards for somebody on Saturday morning? You know, or do I really want to take on that extra task at work just because they're asking if someone will? So there's, you know, like the, the, that's the beautiful thing I love about ADHD is it cuts both ways. Sometimes it's stuff that we should be doing and we don't want to. And other times it's stuff that we really shouldn't be doing, but we've sort of volunteering for. What about that? You know, the one of my favorite uh, uh, memes from from the office with, uh, with the, at least the U.S. version, uh, Michael Scott, where it says, uh, I knew exactly what I needed to do until I realized that I had no idea what I needed to do. Exactly. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's a perfect segue into the imagine stage, right? So, so that connection part is about sorting out the emotion around, well, should I, should I know? And how do I feel about this? The second part is, and, and sorry, I should add too that that connection stage is also a little bit about we we have to reevaluate the emotional connection to doing things. Like they don't always have to feel like a lot of fun, and I think that's a really important delineation that we'll talk more about when we get to motivation. But the imagine stage is is where you figure out I don't know what I need to do, right? And that's where we can use. When of you know, I like to talk about supercharged aspects with ADHD rather than superpowers, because supercharged is a supercharged car can go very fast in the right direction or it can go very fast in the wrong direction. And that's what we're like, right? So if we think about the supercharged aspect of ADHD, we're great at imagining. We're not great at organizing it. So if we want to see if we know what we need to do and figure it out, the best way of doing it is visualizing it. So if we can actually see ourselves going through that process, like imagining our days or imagining the task and, and what, how it would fit in our day and what it would look like for me to do it, very quickly we'll run up against, oh, hang on, I have no idea how to do neurosurgery. Maybe I shouldn't operate today. You know, that sort of thing, right? So that's the, that's the imagine part. And, and, and that's the, again, it's the danger area with ADHD is we do that easily and well. So the idea is that if we can remember that we do it at 30,000 feet, though. We've got to get granular with it. We've got to dive into the weeds. A good example of that, if you want to practice that just for everyone there at home, if they want to practice that on a daily basis, start your day with your diary in front of you. And now I know that may be a, <laughs> a sensitive issue for many people with ADHD, but you should have a diary in front of you and or a, a planner. And actually look at everything you've got to do that day and visualize yourself actually doing it, including the breaks in between, the driving between things, and see if you can see yourself doing it. Now, in five minutes, you'll cover a day, but you'll, I guarantee your day will be much better for it because you visualized it. What about for people with ADHD who have a hard time actually visualizing? Okay, well, that's where you use structures around to support you. It's like everything with ADHD or for anyone for that matter. If you have trouble visualizing, then that's, for example, that's why I use the diary. And I break it down into, well, okay, what am I wearing? What does it look like? Who am I seeing? What would be, what would the sun be like as I'm out in that meeting or, or traveling to that thing? What will the traffic be like? There's all these great visualization cues. There was a great, um, uh, a fantastic researcher from Canada called Yves-Marie Blouin houdon a psychologist over there who did some great research on procrastination, uh, not specifically to ADHD. But she, she introduced a visualization tool that she used um, in a study that showed that it dramatically reduced procrastination. And she included a visualization exercise, which was she got people to visualize eating an apple. And, you know, so you visualize doing something that is very common to you and very easy to do. And you practice doing that. And I use that with my uni student program. I get them to twice a week, they listen to the same visualization of what it's like the night before the exam and what, what do they want to choose to feel like. And I think that's a really important key of this too. We could talk about visualization forever, but the, the, one of the really important key with that too is the choice. Because traditionally, you know, in the 80s, we all went affirmations. You know, I am great. I'm fine. You know, the Gordon Gecko type approach to life. Um, and that's that's positive. But if you want to take it that next step further, introduce that future choice. Introduce, well, how do I want to feel the night before the exam? How do I want to feel it before I walk into that important meeting? How do I want to feel when I walk into my house in the afternoon after I've been at work all day? Do I want to be, you know, grumpy dad coming home from work or do I want to be engaging dad who hasn't seen the people he loves all day? 
So we are going to take a really quick break. And when uh, we come back, we are going to uh, hit the, uh, the M in this, uh, this acronym and talk about motivation. We will be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from ADHD Rewired's coaching and accountability groups. We are happy to announce that all five sections in our summer season of coaching groups are now full. Thank you so much to everyone who attended our registration events and congratulations on taking the first step to getting your ADHD rewired. And thank you to everyone in our coaching community, old and new, for making this amazing community what it is, a safe space for all of us with ADHD to foster even more growth and continuing support. We wouldn't be here without you. And this community wouldn't exist without you. If you want to learn how to better manage your time, take charge of your calendar, create a to-do list that actually makes sense, all while having supportive accountability to get your to-dos done with a group of like-brained adults with ADHD, then go to coachingrewired.com to get your name added to our fall interest list. We have just started a brand new list for the fall. I know many of us have heard that if we just try harder, we can get more done, but it's not about trying harder. It's about learning where we need support, how we can ask for help, and using the tools we learn together to create our own personal ADHD toolbox to reduce our overwhelm and focus more on what matters to us the most. It's about having the supportive community behind us to cheer us on and point out the strengths we have and even the strengths we might forget about when we are struggling. If this sounds like the group and the community you need, then head on over now to coachingrewired.com to get your name added to our fall interest list. And I would encourage you to get on that list early this season. You don't have to get on the list to find out why. That's coachingrewired.com. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from Adult Study Hall, our virtual co-working community. Do you have a creative idea you've been wanting to start? Would you like someone to do laundry with? What about having company while you study? If you think you would benefit from real-time accountability, working beside other adults with ADHD who are also working on things they want to get done, then join our Adult Study Hall membership community at adultstudyhall.com. This is a community for body doubling. Access to Adult Study Hall is only $19.99 a month and it is free for the first week. You can even cancel your membership at any time without any penalties. Your membership will give you instant access to Adult Study Hall 24-7 or ASH 24-7, a dedicated Zoom room that is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's kind of like going to the coffee shop without any of the lines. So you get to pick your own seating and work to your own tunes. Your membership also includes access to our Adult Study Hall Plus or ASH Plus sessions, where you can work on your finances, your most dreaded tasks, decluttering, writing, and more. And if you're looking for a new job, need to update your resume, or are thinking of changing career paths, then join our very own Coach Kat Hoyer for her career accelerator sessions every week. Then I'll be hosting our monthly Pomodoro dance party on Thursday, July 21st at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. We will be working in 50 minute blocks and 10 minute breaks. So this will be a little more than two hours long. Dancing is required if you are physically able to do so and if you're supposed to allow it, but dance skills are not. The idea here is to have fun, get the blood flowing to the brain, get that dopamine flowing, and let's get some stuff done. Join the virtual co-working community created just for us by going to adultstudyhall.com where you can jump into our 24-7 drop-in room or any of our facilitated sessions. Again, it's free for the first week and only $19.99 a month after that. Come work with us. Adultstudyhall.com. All right, we are back. So when we uh, when we left off, we were talking about sort of visualization, and now we're going to talk about motivation. So what in your book, Decoding Doing, um, which is all about procrastination, you know, so much of procrastination is you know, kind of how do we push past the Ottawanas? Yeah, well, actually, I'm, I'm going to get Matt to talk to this, but before she does, I want to preface it a little bit. This is the uh, probably the big discussion we had because everyone focuses on, you know, well, I've got to get motivation, 
motivated to do something. So this magic motivation I've got to pull out of the air and inject into myself and then I can throw myself into it. That's not how we think motivation works. Motivation's an emotion, simple as that. And what are emotions? And if you want to see a really, read an excellent book on understanding what emotions are, Lisa Feldman Barrett wrote a fantastic book, I think 2017, called um, How Emotions Are Made. And for the cheat sheet, you can see her on TED Talks. But she talks about, and she's a research psychologist from the States, she talks about motivation as being Almost like I, I like to, I think I interpret it as an early warning system or a summary system. It's a way of converting a whole pile of information into a very fast reference that we that can guide our actions. So in terms of an early warning system, a trigger, an external trigger, like say, for example, seeing someone walking down the street who looks like someone you once had a fight with will trigger a response an emotional response in you of apprehension, maybe avoidance, that sort of thing, right? Now, what's meant to happen is that just is meant to raise the alarm. Then it hands it off to your attention and your attention is meant to kick in and say, oh, wait a minute, that's not that person. That's okay. And that's from my past and I can keep walking. I might edge to one side of the street, but apart from that, I'm okay. Now, guess which part of that equation we have trouble with with ADHD? It's the turning on the attention part. So we stay, we tend to stay in the emotional part and that's part of the problem. So then we start to see the whole world as something that we have to interpret and trigger emotionally when really it's a tension that will shape that emotional associational story. And that's what I was saying earlier about that we have to get to a point where we see a motivation as, as, as different to, oh, it's got to feel energizing and great. I remember I had a, some clients once and the wife didn't have ADHD, the husband did, and there was a, a debate about doing um, laundry. And the husband, in a moment of frustration, said, but it's not fair, you like doing laundry. And she looked at him like she was going to kill him. And then she, she took a breath in, and I'll, I'll, I, had, I have the greatest respect for this lady. She looked at him and said with the most compassion I've ever seen, said, oh, my God, is that the only way you do anything? Do you have to like it? And he went, Yeah. <laughs> And so I got her to explain what it's like for her as someone who doesn't have ADHD. And, and she said, well, I create a routine that just makes it happen reliably. And I said, what about on the days when you really do not want to deal with the washing? You know, they had small children and washing for small children can be disgusting. So she, <laughs> she, said, um, she said, oh, well, what I do is I create this visual image. And she, 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 it happens automatically. She says, I see you all going out into the world looking clean and confident and it makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I've protected you going into the world. So she pulls up this visual image in her head of them looking like that, and that engenders an emotion in her. She creates the emotion. So everyone out there with ADHD, this is my big takeaway, is create the emotion. Stop reacting to the emotion. And we have to use our attention to do that. And it's no different with this. And um, this is where um, by imagining it in detail and getting that organized, we get to engender the emotion, which won't feel like, woohoo, you know, I'm going, you know, naked water skiing. It's going to feel like, oh, um, this, this just needs to happen now and can happen now. Sorry, so Mad, I'll hand over to you now. <laughs> well, we, uh, it, it sounds like part of what you're saying is we need our cues to remind us what to do. And if we are waiting for feeling like doing a thing to be the cue, we're going to be waiting for a long time and have lots of laundry piling up. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I kind of like even in my, my coaching groups, when we have these conversations and sometimes people will like, it's almost like this first time hearing this idea of like, wait, like we need to do things even when we don't feel like it. How does that work? So how, how does that How work? does that work? <laughs> um, I mean, this stage for, for us in this model is quite a lot like the connect stage in some regards, because what you're trying to do is again, take a moment to notice how you're feeling. And if you're not feeling motivated, then we're, we're looking to, to find some motivation. And one of the um, really powerful methods is what John just talked through, which is that 
visualizing your future self. So whether that's visualized with an image in your mind or whether that's, you know, if you can't do that, then maybe you talk it through with someone or however you access that, but trying to connect and build the relationship you have between yourself now and your future self. If I picture my future self in a year's time and I don't really have much of a relationship with her, I don't care that much about her. She doesn't mean much to me, then that's not going to motivate me. But if I build a relationship with her and I really want stuff for her and I hope she has opportunity and I sort of connect to her, then I'm going to do a lot of things now to make life good for her. Kind of like how you relate to a child, but to yourself. I know like even like on a daily basis for me, uh, there is a, a 10 to 15 minute task that I do almost every night that I hate having to do it. And I'm always grateful that it's done and that's making my lunch. Right. So when I am like noticing that internal resistance, the, the I don't want us, I'm like, Ugh. I just keep thinking my, t- my tomorrow morning self is going to be really grateful for doing this. And so I sort of focus on the a little bit of a mix of like, it feels good to have that part of the, the my stuff done and I have to try to squeeze it into the morning. But also, I also think of like, I know that it's more stressful in the morning and I don't want to feel that. So it's, it's, you know, I, I know there's a lot of, of uh, thoughts around like, you know, focus on the positive, but I think like for me, I don't know, bringing in both has been helpful. Yeah. yeah. So the, the reality of your future self is, is the most tangible way of creating motivation. And again, it's, it's not, not necessarily motivation that it's going to be fun. It's motivation that it's going to benefit me, you know, and, and, you know, we know with ADHD that our time projection is, is challenged. We know we have problems with it. you know, there have been some small fMRI studies that have shown that when people with ADHD think about themselves in the future, the same part of the brain lights up as when they think about a stranger now. So we're thinking about a stranger out there. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a potential but it's not necessarily us, right? Like, and I love that Homer Simpson quote. There's a, a, a scene in The Symptoms, Simpsons where Homer and, and Marge are in the house and the kids are outside playing and Marge says, hey, Homer, you, should, you know, you should go out and play with the kids because future Homer will really regret that he didn't. And Homer says, yeah, that's future Homer's problem. I'd hate to be that guy, you know? <laughs> nice. All right, so, so motivation is something we have to generate. Yeah. Yeah. What are some other yeah. ways that we can do that? Well, I think I think a really big part is, you know, what I was saying about the um, that lovely lady and the washing was firstly, we, we imagine ourselves doing it so we can see ourselves doing it. So we know it's possible. It start it starts to become, oh, yeah, well, that's just logical. I think the other part, too, is it's about playing with time. It's about the context part of, of it. You know, I always think of, you know, when we think of doing any task, we need to think of process. So how I'm going to do it. Then we need to think of the resources we need to do it, including the a- adequate time to do it, which we know we can be terrible at estimating, um, as well as people and things. But then there's also the context. And the context is a really important thing that I, I think we don't often think about. And I, I suspect this is, again, probably a working memory related issue. But, you know, it's all attention, working memory, emotional regulation. They all work together. But basically, it's when is the best time for me to do this? For example, I know that if I have to do something detailed, so, you know, particularly when I was back and I was doing, um, you know, I had a lot more neuroscience research based stuff in my life. If I had to read a lot of really heavy clinical papers first thing in the morning. Now, as someone with ADHD, is that my traditional go to time to do anything? No. However, I learned that, oh, OK, it's quiet. It's, it's sort of like the it's like the, the positive version of late, late at night. Like I love late at night because no one wants me. I'm off the hook. I can just roam wild and I can do all those funky things I like to do. Right. And I have no sense of getting too tired until I just fall asleep at the desk or whatever. But in the morning, I get that same freedom because no one wants me, but I'm charged up. I've, I've slept. So I actually have a lot more control of my executive function. I have a lot more control of my attention. So that's a great time for me to do very detailed work. Even, you know, if I have to make phone calls, I'm better after lunch. I like to, I'm more social after lunch. I've sort of warmed up into the day. I'm a bit loosey-goosey in terms of attention. And that seems to work better socially for me. So when you have the task, I think a really critical thing is to say, when will this work best into microcosm in my day for me, how I function? And everyone out there with ADHD, start paying attention to how you function better at different times. Let's, let's ditch the myths. Late at night feels good. It ain't usually good. Uh, 
But the other thing too is that um, then start looking at the context of the rest of your life. And this is where a diary or a planner comes in handy because you can see all of your commitments mapped out in very concrete terms. And you can say, well, actually, I would have um, just done a, a huge meeting. Will I feel like sitting and reading a detailed report right after that huge meeting? Probably not, you know, so maybe I won't do it then. Maybe I'll do it at another time where I've had a bit of breathing space. And what you're referring to here is the uh, the NAC acronym, the the notice, analyze, choose. Yeah, that? yeah. So yeah. You notice, yeah, yeah. And then you're you, you're applying that to the idea of process, resources, and and context. I was going to say that um, I think something that perhaps we're doing quite explicitly with taking this approach is to rather than just searching for motivation, which is usually what someone will describe is I don't have the motivation and I need the motivation. Where is the motivation? It's more around noticing what's there and then making the choice to actually organize some motivation. And I think that's where that acronym comes in. That serves as a scaffold by which you can help organize how you're feeling and organize that motivation. And then you can use other strategies like the visualizing your future or time management or planning your day to to really build on that and to grow it if you need more oomph, if you like. Yeah. And I, I think to pile on top of that, if you've done the connect and imagine stage properly, the, the motivation just tends to be there. It's, it's, it, it sort of becomes less of this big important thing we've got to go and find. And that's my measure of success. Mm. You know, turning the um, uh, motivation uh, into action one of the things that I we talk about in my coaching groups is, you know, it's like most people in my coaching groups are really bright, intelligent, you know, people, a uh, high IQ. And, you know, we all dealt with that feeling of feeling less than or, or dumb because like, you know, and it's like most people that I'm working with are anything but and tr- kind of differentiating EF executive functions from our IQ. And I tell people like your IQ is probably great. What we want to improve is our YQ. And our YQ is adding the why to the what. So our to-do list is typically a list of what's. And we we know the why enough when we write it, but when we go to look at it, the why is long gone. Hmm. So we look at this, this thing or it's like, well, I don't want to do that. And so yeah. one of the things I encourage people to do is to actually not just write the, the what they need to do, but the why this thing is important to them. Which is that future. It's that connection to their future. That's mm. the why. So in yeah. the future, right now, we have a one more quick break. But when we come back, we're going to talk about the act part, which is actually the, the doing, which is what we're kind of trying to learn how to do. So we will be right back. Get more from ADHD Rewired when you become a patron over at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. I want to welcome our newest patrons, Fiona L. and Daniel W., who joined us this week. Thank you so much for your support and welcome to our Patreon community. Perks start at just $5 a month where you can get ad-free episodes of this show. And at $25 a month, you can join me for our monthly coaching call every fourth Tuesday of the month. In our most recent coaching call, I share some tips tips and strategies previously shared only with our coaching and accountability groups and focused on our to-dos. And for our next monthly coaching call on Tuesday, July 26th at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern, we're going to do that again because it was a lot of fun. So mark your calendars and consider becoming a patron at $25 a month to join our next coaching call on Tuesday, July 26th at 3 p.m. Central, where we will focus on those to-do lists. It'll kind be like a workshop for your to-dos. And if you want to hear some of those tips and strategies that we shared last month, consider becoming a patron at the $10 a month level, where you can get the audio recording of our monthly coaching calls so you don't miss any of the tips we've shared. I am so grateful for the support of our Patreon community. If it's in the budget right now for you, consider becoming a patron over at ADHDrewire.com slash Patreon. Now, over the last couple months, we have seen a kind of significant dip in the number of patrons supporting us. Um, we, we're definitely at a lower level than we have been in quite some time. I know that the cost of probably just about everything is going up. A gallon of gas is about a million dollars right now. So if you're not able to support us right now, you totally get it. 
But if you are, your support will continue to help us grow our team, continue to get the production and editing and everything we do here with the podcast, and will help us to continue reaching out to all of our ADHD friends around the world because we don't have to navigate this alone. Truly, your support is so appreciated. And thank you for helping us make this world a little bit more ADHD friendly. Perks for our patrons start at $5 a month and support can start at any amount. That's ADHDrewire.com slash Patreon. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And thanks. Do you know about all the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network? We have ADHD Essentials with Brendan Mahan, Hacking Your ADHD with Will Curb, and ADHD Diversified with MJ Siemens. You can find all of the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network by going to ADHDrewired.com slash podcast network. Then every second Tuesday of the month, you can join the ADHD Rewired Podcast family and ADHD Rewired coaches Kat Hoyer and Kristen Marks for our monthly live q Q&A. Our next live Q&A is next week on Tuesday, July 12th at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Get the most out of our live Q&As and join us on Zoom by going to ADHDrewire.com slash events to register. And if you enjoy and find value in the show, please consider leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast player that accepts reviews. If you don't want to miss any episode, make sure to hit subscribe subscribe or follow so you don't miss each episode that comes out every week. Whether you've been listening for a while or you are joining us for the first time, thank you for joining us. Discover more from ADHD Rewired by going to ADHDrewired.com. That's ADHDrewired.com. All right, we are back. Let's jump right back into from where we left off. Let's talk about the doing, the act part of uh, of this model. Ah, the act part. Now, this is tricky because here's where we go into the real world. So up until this point, we've been living in our heads, and that's you know we, that's where we like to live because the real world is tricky. It has it has all the benefit of it. You know, we have this lovely tangible stuff of being out and doing stuff and then really achieving stuff. But it always throws up things we didn't expect because it's constantly in motion and moving. And that's okay. We, we can adapt to that. So the translation from the imagining, and once we've built up that motivation to do it, is then about saying, well, okay, how is it being able to monitor how it's working in the real world? Making sure that we're, we are paying attention to things like time and how we're feeling and giving ourselves some feedback on how that process is working. So in other words, the real world is really reliant on some effective problem solving. So we need to, and again, problem solving, notice, analyze, choose. We have to be able to notice that there is a problem. <laughs> um, the second part is, is then we have to be able to pause and solve the problem. And with ADHD, that's a big problem. We, we tend to limp on. Um, I just got to keep going. Otherwise, this thing's never going to get done, Right. And we have to be able to be able to stop and say, it's okay to pause, because if I pause, I might change my direction and make it easier for myself. And then finally, we have to commit to the solution to the problem. Again, something that we, we tend to forget, like we might even fix it one day, the next day, come back to an, like an ongoing task and forget that we'd actually adapted our whole direction, right? So... This is what I think the the act part is really about is because you've already created the plan in time. You've got process, resources and context all in place. And now it's about monitoring as it happens and paying attention to it. So, you know, using the example I had before, like if I get up early to read a paper and I find myself doing the, you know, the thousand foot stare instead of, and you know, you know, hugging my coffee cup pretty much like I was about an hour ago. Then I've got to really say, well, hang on, I thought this early morning thing was going to deliver, but it's not. What's going on? Now, if I went to bed at 1 a.m., then that's probably why the early morning's not delivering. Or if I didn't warm myself up if I'm out of practice, so I need to stop and say, okay, this is not working now. So either I've got to go in and address why it's not working. So with ADHD, I've got to look at my physiology. Am I tired? Am I hungry? What have I done to my dopamine levels? And then the second part is, I, um, and I'm going to give a plug to Monica, my partner here. She did a great talk on the inner pharmacy at the international conference at the end of last year. Um, that talks about the physical, addressing the physiology of ADHD. 
The second thing is then I'm going to say, have I got the system in place that supports me in doing this? In other words, have I put the paper in front of my desk? Do I have a process by which I'm going to read that paper and understand it? Right. And then the last part is my intent. I need to revisit that motivational picture. My future self, what am I benefiting here? So if I'm if I'm stopping and, and noticing that and addressing those problems and then implementing it, then you'll find a lot less of this stall that we traditionally get. So the act stage is like John said, it's it's walking through the task and actually doing it. And the the planning and everything that's come up till now is what's going to support you doing that. But it also builds in troubleshooting. So really consciously noticing if barriers come up, if unexpected things come up and actually responding to those rather than sort of having them um, derail you or stall your um, progress. So is, is this where you would kind of address uh, what I like to call it scope creep? You're working mm-hmm. on a project and all of a sudden like, oh, but I got to do this, which is not actually part of the goal, right? But it's maybe either a nice to have or something that should be dealt with, but not right now. Also, all of a sudden you have this like, you know, a task that maybe would have taken 30 minutes is now like a half day project. Yep. 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 This is where you would hopefully notice that. <laughs> and, 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 and in noticing that there's, there's a really big ADHD cue in there, right? So impulse control, the doing this thing has triggered, oh, I, now reminds me, I should also do that. So there's that impulse control bit. But there's also this anxiety bit. You know, a lot, a lot of the time when I'm working with clients and, um, and you know, I, I'm yet to work with a client has, that has not had ADHD, I'm sorry, anxiety in the background of ADHD. And to me, it makes perfect sense. If you're not in, don't feel in control of your future, you're going to be anxious and that's going to compound itself with experience. And, you know, the anxiety bit is if, even if you, you feel like you're solving the current thing, then you'll produce the next problem and the next problem and the next problem and the next problem. So it's, it's, it's absolutely about that, about keep bringing yourself back on, no, this is what I'm doing now. Is it working or is it not working? And let's, let's make sure we ad- have a way of addressing those distractions. And my favorite way is I use a parking lot. You know, I, I work for a big American company and when they gave talks, they were very into the parking lot idea, which was, you know, if someone asks a question that you're not ready to answer right now, you write it on a, on a whiteboard and then you return, return to them at the end of the session. So I use a little notepad where anything that else pops up that I think I should go and do that, I write it in my parking lot. Yeah, and then great. at the end of the session, I look at it and 99% of the time, I have no intention of doing any of that stuff. And then the other 1% of the time, you probably look at what you wrote and you're like, I don't even know what this means. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Which happened to me today. I was, I, every Tuesday I go through and uh, clear off my desk with my uh, alumni um, we just do a five minute desk decluttering and I'm always just a clearing off of these sticky notes, which is just my externalized working memory. They're just like those, those little things like in a meeting, I just want to like not interrupt, but I want to make sure I bring up. So I, you know, jot them all down. I'm looking at these things. I'm like, I don't even know what this meant or who this person is or, you know, so that happens too. <laughs> or, or read my own writing. <laughs> and, well, speaking of that, I wrote down the, the, uh, the, the SEMA, uh, acronym, and I can read all of but my last word, which is right after ACT. What did I write? It's, it's achieve. achieve. And this one, this one is very dear to my heart. Um, this is this is when this is again. It's quite emotional, and it's really important because it's the bit that means that you actually build some confidence and some mm-hmm. sense of competence around your capacity to do something. So I guess it's it's again taking a moment to notice what you've done, actually allow that to land and give yourself credit and notice what you have achieved and actually build that self-esteem. And then there's also the pragmatic piece around, well, what could I have done differently? And is there something to learn from this? And what skills do I need to develop? And a little bit of learning. But I think importantly, it's the emotional piece of actually saying, yay, I did a thing. Woohoo. Like it, it's, it's the cheerleader part. I imagine you uh, both see this too in your practices and that's the how much difficulty people have with owning their accomplishments. Mm -hmm. How do you help people with that? Well, I, I, I first say to them, if someone gives you a compliment, say thank you. And if you can't say anything else positive, don't say anything else positive and start learn, learn to start to just sit with the praise 
because you know I, I used to do that too i mean i still do it occasionally when people say oh we well, well done at running that big meeting or whatever i did and my first thing is yeah but it could have been better i, I could have tried harder i could have organized a bit better all this negative self-talk which you know to be quite blunt and in, in another australian idiom is bullshit um <laughs> i think we use the same one here in the u.s oh, yeah 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 it's a <laughs> universal language of of negativity but um and the other thing too is, as Madeline's saying, is to really sit in in what what made that successful. Why why is that good? Why would anyone think that was a good thing? I think everyone does this to a degree, but I think with ADHD, we we focus so much on what went wrong or what what wasn't quite as we imagined in our wonderful you know multicolored imagination that we forget to look at what went right. You know, um, I start off um, most of my coaching sessions and so does my partner with, well, and, you know, I don't use the term win as much um, as she does, but um, I, I always say to people, well, when did it work for you? Because that's the cool thing about ADHD. No matter how bad our life gets, there was a time when stuff did work. There was, And it might have just been this morning for 15 minutes. But that's okay. That worked. And that's what, you know, if I'm talking to, say, a new client and they're talking about all these troubles they're having in their marriage, their work, all that sort of stuff right now, I'll ask them, well, tell me, when, when did it work? Oh, you know, I got through school and uni, okay. There were some wobbles, but, and then I say, well, okay, well, let's, let's dig into those. And they'll say, but I don't need to talk about them. They worked. I said, no, they're the ones we do need to talk about because they worked for a reason. So, you know, as Madeline said, if we're able to sit in, in our achievement, if we're able to stop and pay attention, that is your toolkit for the future. And it will be different from other people. And that's OK. You know, my toolkit for how I do stuff, I don't usually I don't usually lead with, hey, I've got ADHD. I mean, anyone who knows anything about ADHD reads it from about 50 feet away. But I tell people how I like to work. So in other words, one of the reasons I'm writing a book with Madeline is, um, A, she's a genius, but the other reason is, um, and she tolerates me, but the other reason is I know that I work best in collaboration. And it's not just the accountability part. In fact, I think that's the lesser part. The bigger part for me is the verbal processing part. As you can all hear, I like to talk, and that's how I figure stuff out, right? So, you know, I tell people that's a great way of working with me is let's collaborate, let's talk. And so that's what when you stop to notice how you achieve something, you end up with tools that you can apply again and again and again. Can I add something that I've observed with with working with adults with ADHD is that I think often by the time they get to the end of the task, I guess the novelty of that activity has worn off somewhat or sufficiently to sort of no longer really be holding their attention easily. So they're very quick to move to the next, the next interesting, exciting kind of challenge, creative, whatever. And I, I think they just don't think or forget to sort of really mark the occasion of the achievement and really just take a moment to notice it. So I think sometimes it, it's because of negativity, but also it's, sometimes it's just, it's, it's it sort of doesn't hold their focus, but it's important. So uh, yeah, I guess it's, we've put it in here because it's really something that builds self-esteem. And so often the self-esteem issues is what leads to the anxiety and the depression and all the other stuff. So it's an important protective factor. I know when I was uh, when I was first diagnosed with ADHD uh, twenty some years ago, I used to refer to it as like my ninety five percent disorder. I would do just about everything I needed to do up to the ninety five percent mark, and then I would be then I would abandon whatever it was I was doing to move on to the next thing that would get my attention. Oh, absolutely, yeah, and and that's that's why it's so critical to have an endpoint, like to have clear criteria that have I ticked all these boxes or not? Because that's the other thing we don't do well. We don't end well. Like you said, we flip on to the next thing, like you're both talking about, whatever's grabbed our attention next. And and I think a lot of it is that when we get past that, we get over that hump of of, of acting, we 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 feel like it's done. There's no there's no emotional threat there anymore. Mm. You know, I know that uh Jonathan, from from knowing you, I know you're you are very bright. I'm wondering if uh as a person with ADHD, working with a person without ADHD, um, did you have in your contracts that at the 95% mark, the rest is all you, Madeline, to, to finish the book? No, but I do feel it may have gone that way, <laughs> reflecting <laughs> upon it. 
Uh, yes, re- reflecting there was there was definitely points where Madeline said, hey, now remember we've still got to do this. And I'm going, yeah, yeah, that's cool. But, you know, we should do a book about anxiety in ADHD. Oh, yeah. We've got a lot of other plans, Eric. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> Surprisingly. Um, yeah. And, 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 I, and, you know, as we toasted champagne over the, the finishing of the book, I, I actually said to Madeline, you know, it wouldn't be finished without you, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I, gave, I give all credit to Madeline. So, um, and it was her who said, yeah, no, no, you probably need to review that chapter. You know, John, it's, it's probably the same as the chapter before it, right? <laughs> so, so Jonathan, I want to ask you, um, is there anything that you could say that you learned about yourself doing this book with, with oh, me? Oh, we learned so much about myself. <laughs> um, firstly, firstly, I, I was right in all the ways I've learned to the, all those, all those that toolkit for how I get stuff done. That stuff is absolutely true. Working with someone like Mad and 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 she's wonderful to work with because she's remarkably patient um, with me. But also too, she's she's willing to go on that that journey that that you know magical flight of imagination with me, even though it may sound like it's going somewhere completely weird and dangerous for a minute. That willingness to accept. But in terms of actually, you know, for example, the next time I write a book, um, firstly, I will actually write the full concept out before I start. I will cement a lot of the ideas before I start, and then I will do what I, I coach everyone else to do. I will create a really solid structure behind each step and put times to it, put the context to it and, you know, again, see if Mad's free um, and um, <laughs> and get her to keep an eye on me. But, um, yeah, that's the main thing is that going back to that, that, that imagining stage, getting really granular with it, that's what I would do differently next time. Marilyn, what about you? What, what, uh, did you learn anything about yourself working with Jonathan on this book? I definitely learned a lot about myself. I don't think we would have got to the end if we didn't have the other person there mm-hmm. sort of holding our hand and, and keeping us going when it got tricky or, or tedious. The thing that I loved about working with John is that he's so creative and these sort of the way his ideas link together and, and you know, sometimes they're very left field and they make no sense, but sometimes they're just beautiful and I, I'm not nearly as creative a person in how I think about things. I'm much more linear and it's it's just been wonderful. I think that what we've created wouldn't exist without that. So it's, yeah, it's been really valuable. And Jonathan, isn't it like magical to work with someone who thinks linearly? Oh, absolutely. I was just thinking linear <laughs> is magic. Like, how do you do that? Like, oh, yeah. So we're, we're getting close to the end here. Um, I know that there is some, uh, you're doing some work with, uh, with Ada and you wanted to mention some stuff that you are, that you're doing. With yeah. Ada. Yeah. I'm very excited. I'm, I'm on the board of Ada um, and it's an organization that I, I hold very dear to my heart because they do stuff. Um, Ada is, is now huge. It has, I think it's probably potentially has the largest membership in the world now um, mm-hmm. for people with ADHD. And I think the reason they do is because they do stuff now. They also um, have a lot of ADHD going on in their board. Um, and they also just, it was weird. I walked in, I had this idea for a meeting and I threw it out at them. And the first time ever, no one said, oh, that sounds a bit odd or that's dangerous. Or they all just went, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I thought, shit, now I've got to do it. So what it is was we looked at what I do with coaching. I looked at what I do with coaching. And, and, and what I noticed is with coaching is that we give a bit of information, we apply it to life, and then people go and do it. Now, when we sit and watch webinars, while they're wonderful and, and lectures, they're wonderful to get that information. It's difficult for someone with ADHD to translate that into action. So what we do, what I've designed is a workshop format that is very interactive. And basically, it's led by a lived experience host to make that connection to I've got ADHD too, and this is what this problem means to me or this, this area means to me. And then having short expert presentations to very specific ideas that they then would then break out into breakout sessions with facilitators and small groups where they workshop it. Um, okay, so I've got this idea now, I'm going to apply it to my life. For example, um, Matt and I did the SEMA code um, as one recently. In fact, we're doing it again for out of members in, in a few weeks. So you get to actually apply the idea straight away. And then you come back and you get feedback and you give another, another short bit of information and do it again. Now, that's a two and a half hour mini one. We call them sparks. The spark sessions, the full ones, are four and a half hours where you have three expert speakers and you'll be facilitated through the whole thing. 
Now, as part of that, we're, we're bundling that into, I wanted to do a truly international meeting. And by that, I mean that everyone gets to go in their normal waking hours, which I know with ADHD could be any time, but I'm talking about, say, neurotypical waking hours. So what we're going to do is we're going to deliver three full sparks. So these are three four and a half hour, um, very interactive change sessions. They'll all run concurrently. There's one on ADHD and work, another one called You, Me and ADHD, which is uh, relationships. And the third one is ADHD and me, which is about discovering your story, your narrative for ADHD and, and learning how to project in the future and shape it. So they run concurrently. They're going to run concurrently in the Oceana time zone first. Then a few hours later, they're going to run live in um, Europe uh, from India through to Europe and Africa. And then an hour or two after that, they're going to run live right through the Americas. So wherever you are in the world, you will be able to attend, interact with live people, get the same content. And if you've got ADHD and not too fond of sleep, you could even attend multiple workshops across those three. The other part that we're adding to it is uh, when I, uh, Eric, you know, most of the time I saw you at, com I see you at conferences, we're both wandering the corridors, not attending stuff, because um, I like to switch and change. And I miss that with this virtual thing. So I found an app called Gather Town, which is really cool. It's like you, you drive a little avatar around, but as you walk up to someone, Zoom screens pop up so you can talk in real time. So Adder has adopted Gather as their new virtual community space. So for the 30 hours of the meeting, as the three time zones are running, gather our gather, which we're calling the Adiverse, will be open in the background. And anyone from anywhere in the world can go there and hang out with other people with ADHD from all over the world. And there'll be, there'll be out of session stuff organized there and support groups and discussions and all that sort of stuff. So that's where our community is going to be. So you can do both. And it's happening on the 22nd and 23rd of July, Eastern time. So it's Eastern US it starts in your evening on a Friday, for which will be basically what Matt and I will be the Australian. We experience that now, daylight hours, um, and then goes on from there. So for 30 hours, you can come and mingle. And the other thing we're doing is we're reaching out to ADHD groups around the world and saying, you know, everything from, from you know, big associations down to meetup groups come and be here. We will give you free access to represent yourself there within the gather space. You'll be able to, ideally, I'm hoping, I want to be able to walk around a room that looks like the world, um, like as a world map, and interact with people, ADHD groups from all over the world. So that's what we're doing. Where can people learn more about this and also uh, give us a, uh, a link to where they can find about your book and anything else you guys got going on? Okay, so if you want to find about uh, the, the, we're calling it the ADHD Global Gathering for Adder, um, go to Adder's website at add.org and you'll be able to find it through the links there for our book, Mad. Uh, it, we've got a site, decodingdoing.com, uh, or you can buy it through Amazon, Kindle and uh, paperback. And we will get the links to all of those things on this episode's show notes. Jonathan Hassel and Madeline O'Reilly, thank you so much. I know it's early where you are, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it's just just kicked past 5.30 in the morning. So, <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being here early on the other side of the world. I, I really appreciated this and uh, best of luck with uh, the book and everything. And I really appreciate you spending the time with us. Uh, and thanks, thanks Eric. Eric. And th thanks for everything you do, Eric, too. This is a wonderful podcast. And um, yeah, I really appreciate you and everything you do. Thank you so much. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find timestamped summaries and additional resources for each episode. Apply to join our free and secret Facebook community. Learn more about our award-winning intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. Join the Adult Study Hall virtual co-working membership community. Find all the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't hear anywhere else. And use the search tool to find episodes on specific topics. You can do all of this at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click on the Patreon button. If you are a regular listener, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. 
This show is free to you, the listener, but it's not free to produce. Plus, patrons get cool perks like ad-free episodes and access to recordings of coaching calls and $25 a month patrons can join me once a month for a group coaching call. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see selective interviews and other videos I've made. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, your therapists, your coaches, doctors, siblings, parents. And if you, your coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at the website, ADHDrewired.com. If you are a member of Chad, Ada, or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this show and all the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really loved this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person, and I do count on you to help spread this message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other app that supports reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Here is my list of must-listen-to audiobooks updated July 2021. Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, attached by Amir Levin and Rachel Heller. Atomic Habits by James Clear. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. The Coaching Habit by Michael Stainer. The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Rest by Alex Sujong Kim Pang. The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. Make It Stick. The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown. The Productivity Project by Chris Bailey. Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. I always recommend to my coaches and admin that they read that book. The One Thing by Gary Keller, a required reading for all of our coaching group members. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Baden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. And if you're looking for something a little bit more magical, I have fallen in love with the Harry Potter series and the narrator, Jim Dale, is amazing. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus, all of her stuff is great. Starting with Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, and The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or leader, be sure to check out her book, Dare to Lead. Do you have something that you would like to share? Click on the podcast tab at ADHD Rewired. Click the button to be a guest at the top of the page and schedule a 15-minute interview. This is Eric Tibbers, reminding you to keep learning, growing, and connecting. Self-care is not selfish. No matter what you get done or don't get done, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. And we don't need to do them in the hardest way possible. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.